Welcome everyone uh, to our COVID-19 and hematologic malignancies expert insights uh, to help us understand what this crisis really means for the care of patients with hematologic malignancies. We've already had an expert roundtable, uh, and now this week's uh, segment is going to be focusing on lymphoma, and I'll introduce uh, our guest in just a moment. My name is Dr. Joseph McHale. I'm a hematologist and a professor at the Translational Genomics Research Institute in Phoenix, which is an affiliate of City of Hope. We've been genuinely trying through the series to give practical advice to hematologists and oncologists who care for patients throughout this period of time, whether they have COVID or not. Of course, uh, it's really affected the way we handle all of our practices. And so this week, as I mentioned, we're going to be speaking about lymphoma. Next week, we're going to talk about myeloma. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have further roundtables with patient advocates and focus on myeloid diseases in the future sessions. But for today, I'm particularly happy to uh, welcome a guest with me who is uh, not only a world-renowned lymphoma physician, but also a very good friend. Uh, Dr. John Leonard is with me today. Leonard is at uh, uh, Weill Cornell. He is a distinguished professor there uh, and is also um, the uh, Senior Associate Dean for Innovation Initiatives. Um, and so, uh, John, it's a pleasure always to see you, and I'm happy uh, that you're able to be with me today. No, my pleasure. This is a great topic and uh, literally one that we are dealing with on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis as uh, patients come in and we're trying to figure out uh, how to care for them, as I'm sure many people in the audience are as well. Absolutely. And, and we're very glad, John, that you're with us in particular, not just because of your expertise in lymphoma, but because, you, of course, your location, being in New York City. Uh, and for those of you who are following this program, as you know, we've included individuals from New York, from San Francisco, from Seattle, from Chicago. We've really tried uh, to get a diversity of input from different places, focusing uh, in many respects on those hot spots where we have seen many of these uh, patients, unfortunately, in our country. Well, John, let's get right into lymphoma. So we know in general, we divide lymphomas into more uh, chronic, indolent-like lymphomas, and then of course, more aggressive and indeed curable uh, lymphomas. Why don't we start with the indolent lymphomas? And I just wanted to get your take on uh, how you've potentially altered your practice or what has your approach been during this crisis to an indolent patient uh, at diagnosis, potentially at relapse, and even when it comes to their imaging and to the kind of follow-up you have with them. Has this, has this changed your practice, and if so, how? Well, I think, uh, and that's a great way to think about it, uh, the, the chronic pa patients or patients with chronic diagnoses who are managed long-term versus the curable uh, group. I think that's a great way of framing the questions, and I think really what this has done is tried to is, is emphasized or reinforced things that I think we should be doing anyway in practice, but often are not just because we have technologies available to us that maybe we don't have to use quite as often. And we'll come back to that uh, specifically. So for indolent lymphoma patients, and again, as the audience knows, most commonly these would be patients with follicular lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, some patients with mantle cell lymphoma who have slower growing disease. You could even argue CLL is right in the middle of that as well. Um, those are patients where um, this is a chronic disease, as I tell patients, it's like a hitchhiker. Uh, and so the bottom line is that um, if the patient is feeling well and doing well, um, there's a pretty good chance that we don't have to jump in and do a lot. So for that, for that uh, kind of perspective, um, we've been doing a lot with video visits because I think that if the patient um, through telemedicine, if you can take a history, see how they're doing, um, if they've got some, some uh, concerning lymph node that they could even show you on the video camera on occasion, um, you can get a pretty good feel for that patient, particularly if it's a patient in follow-up. Uh, that uh, you can monitor that patient for a period of time. Um, so I would say that most of those patients, most indolent lymphoma patients, 
we are seeing by video visit and we're really asking them how are you feeling any swelling any pain any fatigue uh, any dyspnea a lot of those visits are centered around covid precautions um, and patients always have questions around around that what can they do how compromised is their immune system but i would say that uh, we've been mostly trying to get away without scanning and i think that's something that um, we teach our fellows that if the patient feels well, if their labs are good and their exam is benign, the idea that a scan is gonna change something is very low. Now, honestly, we're not working with all of that. We don't have the exam, we may or may not have the labs. But I would say that for most people, if they're feeling well and there's nothing obvious going on, um, we may or may not have local labs available to us. We're generally not doing imaging, we're deferring imaging. Um, which we probably should be anyway, as I said in that context. And uh, we're and with new patients, it's almost the same sort of thing. We do the video visit. We may or may not have imaging. Typically, new patients are getting imaging because they had some finding that led to their diagnosis, and so we know a little bit about what's going on. Um, but mostly, we're doing that by by video, unless the patient has symptoms. Now, if they have symptoms and they need labs or they need imaging, we have that available. We're doing that, whether it's locally or uh, within our center. Uh, and well, it sounds like it's really kind of fitting with the research, and actually, I think really some impressive papers over the last several years showing that a lot, most lymphoma patients, if not almost all of them can be detected and relapse clinically without necessarily needing the scan. So you're, you're following that modality to a certain degree, aren't you, even through that through this COVID? Yeah, that's right. Now, again, it's obviously, I may be asking the patient, do you feel any lumps as opposed to me, you know, feeling for their spleen or something like that. But I think, you know, for the short term, I think that's okay, um, as long as the patient's asymptomatic and not noticing anything. So basically, for those patients that are doing well, as you've described, you can really mostly do video, video visits. I know for my practice, that's what I'm doing for the overwhelming majority, but there are some that still have to come in. I mean, I always think of the concern that we don't want to under-treat someone with a real disease, even if it's indolent. So you're still all having those patients come in that are having symptoms or that may feel a significant swelling that may be consistent with the lymph node. So you are bringing those folks in, are you? Yeah, and I would say that even though they had indolent lymphomas, I had a couple patients in last week who, uh, who had symptoms, who needed an exam, and, and at least in one case, I'm starting them on treatment because those symptoms prompt, prompt therapy. Okay, that's really helpful because I think we always want to find that balance, but you know, to hear an expert like yourself reassuring us that for you know the majority of these patients that are clinically so well you know we can conduct video visits with them um, and, and that's I think going to really help people in the community. Now if we move then from the more indolent side to the more aggressive side so the diffuse large b-cell lymphomas and those that are potential and, and indeed have more aggressive disease what what has been your approach with them John? Yeah, so I, before we leave indolent, I would just mention maintenance therapies are something we're doing a lot less of and putting those on hold. But as I said, patients that need treatment for indolent lymphoma, we're giving them the full range of things if they need it. On the aggressive side, and those are most typically diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma, um, those are obviously curable entities. And we still, those patients have known disease that's curable. Most of those diagnoses or the subsets of those diagnoses, the majority of patients are cured, and we clearly don't want to compromise that. So we're moving ahead with treatment. So those patients, uh, if they're newly diagnosed, typically what I've done is a video visit where we have the time to um, review things in a lot more detail um, and get the history and talk to them about what to expect. And in many cases for those patients, we set them up for treatment and then do another in-person visit the day of the first treatment so that we can make sure there's nothing on exam or on labs or whatever that's, that's surprising um, as a double check. So that's one kind of way of doing it. Um, but we are treating people with our CHOP, we've treated people with ABVD um, and, and just moving ahead, um, giving them you know, a lot of instruction as far as the precautions to take. Uh, but clearly those patients have curable disease, we don't wanna mess that up. And um, 
you know, the data on what the risk is to those patients with COVID, I still, I, I still think is a little bit uncertain. My sense is that those patients, that any of these patients are more vulnerable, but exactly how vulnerable they are and what can modify that or worsen that, I think is not entirely clear. Um, but the bottom line is that if they have a curable disease, if they have indications for therapy, we move ahead in a very cautious way. Now, just as in yeah. the indolent subtype, we're not doing as much imaging and we're doing follow-up in kind of the same way, mostly by video visit, unless there's something that urgently needs an intervention. Yeah, no, I agree with you, John. I think there is always, and, and I know we've discussed at our expert roundtable as well, you know, how susceptible are our patients? I, I think part of that has been mitigated by the fact that we, we honestly do teach our patients the importance of hand washing and disinfecting and uh, at times wearing a mask. And so I think that, you know, has an impact to try and pragmatically reduce that risk. One question I have with you about your regimen. So, so I, obviously you, you don't want to miss the opportunity to potentially cure some of these patients that have curable disease. One of the questions that's been floating around the heme malignancy community has been the dosing of steroids. And again, I don't think we really know if steroids make a difference with susceptibility to COVID, but have you just followed the standard protocol, whatever your RCHOP protocol is, or, or you know, these ABVD, the bendamustine protocols, like whatever you have, you haven't made any changes to the steroid component, have you? We, we have not. Um, I think that's a great question as to whether we should be. Uh, I think in the curable settings, which is, you know, our chop, again, does it matter if we lower the steroid dose? Probably not, I would say. On the other hand, how much does it help by lowering the steroid dose to re reduce an infection risk? We don't know. Interestingly, at least at one point in the COVID experience, steroids, certainly in Italy, have been part of the standard treatment of treating COVID. So that adds a whole nother twist to it. I don't think we think it prevents it, but it may, at least some have felt along the way that steroids are part of the severe COVID uh, treatment regimen, although again, not really based on firm data. So uh, in the absence of, well, they could help or they could hurt, we've just kind of gone down the middle of the fairway and done the usual thing. Yeah, and I think actually that approach is what I've been hearing most from people. I think there were a few groups when this first happened that were putting out guidelines that maybe we should be dose reducing steroids. But I think just as you've said, I think most people have just said, if you're actually going to genuinely choose, you know, don't dilute as it were what you're treating with. But obviously in the maintenance context and so on, as you mentioned, there may be a little less uh, aggressiveness. Well, John, we're just about done with time, but any last I, thoughts, anything else you want to share to the practicing hematologist and oncologist when they're looking at their you know, lymphoma, be it Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's, be it CLL, any other last minute advice that you could share with them? Yeah, I, I would just say that people who are in practice have a good sense of how to take care of patients. And I think this is the kind of thing where you have to listen to the patient, you have to trust your judgment. And, um, you know, following strict guidelines and saying, well, you have to do it this way. You have to, you know, make sure you check counts on this day or have to get a scan or have to do this. I mean, I think it's a good time to say that, well, there are a lot of ways to manage patients in practice. And, you know, we're good clinicians. We have good judgment. And at times we have to deviate from what we normally do. And perhaps that's a good thing in, in regular practice, but certainly in times where, um, you know, we need to be a little more critically thinking about what's really uh, essential to the management versus what can kind of be put aside, at least temporarily. Yeah, that's great, John. Thank you. I think, you know, for those who are listening to this, th this is a theme that's recurring that we're clearly going to be discussing uh, throughout the whole of the series is that this has not just changed our practice in the very short term. There are things that we're learning, uh, even about, as we've discussed today, John, the benefit of video chats and video uh, consults with patients. I, I suspect part of that is going to stay. I do think that there are patients that we can in future not have to bring in uh, for sake of, of uh, we can use technology to leverage our patient care. I'd really like to thank everybody for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. We uh, particularly grateful to iMedics uh, in hosting this with us. 
Uh, we've had a number of supporters through educational grants. So we appreciate their support as well. Uh, as I mentioned, this is really just the second week in multiple weeks of uh, this series. We look forward next week to interviewing Dr. Nina Shaw uh, from the University of California in San Francisco to talk a little bit about myeloma. And we'll have multiple other uh, events in the future, including uh, focus on myeloid diseases and patient advocacy. If you do have a question, there is in your navigation bar an opportunity there to submit a question. We can answer it in future sessions, so please feel free to do that. Uh, but again, I'd like to thank you for your participation today and trust this helps you as we care for our patients in this very unusual time and hopefully care for them in the best way we can. Thanks again for your attention. Thank you.